Okay, so sensation and perception, you need to know the difference between the two. So we will take a look at what the difference is. If you're looking at sensation, you're talking about what kind of energy is out there in the environment and how that energy is being basically brought inward towards the brain. So <clears throat> um, the physical energy is the stimulus and then that gets transferred to the brain via the sensory structures that we'll be talking about. And the sensory structures are what are going to contribute uh, to the neural conversion or the coding processes we'll see. So sensation takes place at the level of the sensory structures, so like the eye or the ear, or whatever, the skin. Um, if you th are thinking about perception, then that's kind of the next step, and that happens in the brain. And so that would take place um, in each of the different cortical areas. So like visual perception takes place in the back of your brain in the occipital lobes, as we know. And so the perception is just simply the process by which we select, organize, and interpret the sensory signals that have come in from the sensory structures. All right, so uh, one of the things that you need to know is the difference between something called bottom-up processing, bottom-up perceptual processing, and top-down perceptual processing. And so basically what the way to differentiate between the two of them is to know what's at the bottom and to know what's at the top and then realize that bottom up starts from the bottom and goes upward and the opposite is true for top down. So bottom, at the bottom what we see is this analysis of the actual stimulus. So you're picking up the fine, finely tuned parts of the stimulus and in, in, in its component parts. So most of us look at this a and we see it as an A. We don't think about the lines or the shapes that go together to make it an A. But if you think about a child who's learning how to read, that A means nothing to them. So what they need to do is start from the bottom up and look at the angles of those two lines and how they are built together. And then through the process of doing this multiple times, then they begin to recognize A's and feel like it's happening automatically. Okay. So bottom up is always starting with the the elemental stimuli and then building up to experiences at the top. And so if you're going from the top down, you might <coughs> get an experience of what that's like by looking at this particular piece. If you try to read this, you'll notice that you don't really have that rough of a time. As you continue to read it, you'll see why. So again, as, as the paragraph explains, as you see, there are certain words that are not scrambled, and so that's enough to provide basically like a skeletal framework for how to interpret any of those words that might be scrambled up. So as long as the first and last letter are okay, you perceive that as what you expect to be there, even if it's not exactly um, you know, the case as you look at the exact letters and so on. This is why, guys, it's really hard sometimes to proofread your own paper because you type it and you know exactly what you meant to say and you don't realize that you omitted a word. You don't realize that you've spelled something obviously wrong. You don't realize that you accidentally put the in there two times in a row um, because of that top-down processing. Because you have the expectancy and the past experience with the piece, you assume that what is there is really what you expected to be there. So top-down processing relies on schema, experiences, and expectations. That's what's at the top. You work your way down then to the elemental stimuli and get confirmation basically that either you're right, that is what you expected it to be, or you're wrong. One of the examples here is um, basically you can read this as the cat, but what a further closer analysis of the stimuli will show you is that the two letters, if you will, in the middle are actually exactly the same stimulus, but because you expected that in the first case what we were trying to say was the word the, because your expectations based on your experience with the English language lead this to fit into whatever letter category it most would resemble in this context. Same thing with the same stimulus in the middle of the C and the T. Again, your expectancy would be that that would be a vowel because it's between two consonants, and so instead of interpreting it as an H, you interpret it as an A. One of the more... Okay, so if you look at this slide... There we go. Um, if you look at art pieces, and I know it's kind of hard because the, 
the bars and the way there, but if you look at art pieces, especially abstract pieces, those are pieces that sometimes are really difficult to interpret from a bottom-up kind of perspective. Once you know that this piece is entitled, the forest has eyes, it'd be nice if somebody would turn off the lights so I can't reach, I'm tethered. Um, but then you know to look for some of the other types of stimuli that you might be able to build together into faces, and so some of the faces might be popping out at you now. Okay, now that we have the lights off, also. Um, but so knowing the title of a piece sometimes, like the title of, of a work of art or a title of a, a song or a, a composition, sometimes encourages top-down processing, so you're supposed to then have a better um, ability to interpret what the stimuli are that are there. So we're going to talk about psychophysics next. Psychophysics is really um, where psychology started. If you think about people like Wilhelm Wundt and William James and structuralism and functionalism, this is what they were interested in knowing more about. So they had people come in and uh, introspectively describe their experiences with stimuli. So <coughs> if you think about some of the dimensions that they might have been interested in, obviously with light, they're interested in brightness and um, clarity of the image and so on and and so how there's consistency and difference between what is actually present in the physical environment as far as energy and how we interpret it as uh, as being psychologically perceived uh, so one of the basic concepts is thresholds and so we have two different thresholds that we need to know one is absolute threshold and the other is difference threshold Absolute, kind of think of what that word means. It's kind of a yes or no. It's present or it's not present. And so the way that we operationalize the idea of an absolute threshold actually is um, not as absolute as what you might think it is. Uh, partly this is because what we know is that it plays, there's this thing called signal detection theory that actually alters the idea of when is it a yes and when is it a no? How do I know that it's actually present? And so they've operationalized this as uh, the amount of stimulus that's needed to d have it be detected at least 50% of the time. So if you can get it right at least half the time at that particular frequency, at that particular level of uh, intensity, then that's pretty much where the absolute threshold is for that sense. So in a hearing test, most of you guys have had that experience where you're like, hear the beeps and whatever, and you're raising your hand. Do you hear it? Do you not hear it? Um, if you were to hear the same beep, same loudness, same frequency, 10 times, and you'd raise your hand for five of them, that would be at your absolute threshold for that particular uh, that, that frequency. And again, it's a case where um, you know, it's going to differ. Certain characteristics or factors are going to play into whether or not we hear it or see it at various times. So these are some examples of absolute thresholds by sense. And if you think about this, a can of flame seen at 30 miles on a clear night, that means if you have a friend that's going to college at point and they, you know, barring any sort of geographical interruptions and so on and, and, and atmospheric conditions, you'd be able to see them with a candle lit at the top of their dorm from here, okay, and that's, I mean, that's 30 miles, that's really, really, really far, um, and so that's, you know, that we can detect that about 50% of the time, and some of the other ones you can see. Um, basically, you get the sense that we have uh, certain senses that are better, more fine-tuned to uh, be able to detect faint stimuli and also differences, as we'll see. Subliminal stimuli then are qualified as anything that falls below that absolute threshold. So if you're only detecting it 40% of the time, even though sometimes you'll detect it, it's actually technically subliminal. So sub means under, liminal means the border or the edge. And so it's below the level of, of detection, if you will. So subliminal stimuli <coughs> supposedly can influence your behavior. We looked at an example with back masking for our uh, just to kind of relate back what we just did to what we're doing now. Um, one of the things that people believed is that there was subliminal messages in things like advertising and in like the, like before you saw the movie, like all of the like turn off your cell phones and all that kind of stuff. That ended up being a hoax. They, they, it was suggested that they were putting in like Coca-Cola advertisements and those sorts of things. And, um, and so the 
the person that was famous for it ended up admitting that it was a hoax. But what we do know is that even though it can't have major, major impacts on, you know, big decisions that we're making because of all the conscious uh, influence of stimuli around us, uh, what we do know is that there are certain sort of minor changes that can be made. So is it possible that, you know, when you see a political ad and like part of a word is framed out so that it's right above the head of a candidate that they're like attacking in the ad, can that like over time through classic conditioning make it more likely that you dislike that person if they're associated with that word and it's a negative word? Sure. Okay. So priming we know makes a response more likely. Uh, but things like self-help tapes that you're supposed to be able to listen to like while you're sleeping and so on, that is not um, as helpful as perhaps what they are advertised. So the publicity sense, we described people who are obviously offering up testimonials, maybe paid, um, paid endorsements and so on. And what we need is just a more careful consideration of, of uh, empirical studies and so on. Uh, can it influence us in a minor way? Yes, but it has no potential for mind control, so we don't need to worry about Big Brother and so on from the TV and the advertisements. Um, and again, it might just be that the, the judgments that are affected are simple sorts of judgments, minor kinds of things. Um, one of the <coughs> major concepts here related to absolute threshold is signal detection theory. And so signal detection theory uh, provides us with a, a mathematical model of these various factors here that are going to influence even something as simple as a hearing test. Like, why would I, why would I not be sure if I heard something or didn't hear something? When am I going to be more likely to report that something's there uh, or something's not there? So one of the things that we know makes a difference and that factors into the signal detection theory, P.S. they love to ask about this on the AP test, is sensitivity. Obviously, the, the more faint the signal is, the closer it is to your absolute threshold, the more difficult it's going to be for you to distinguish it um, and to identify it. Um, it's affected individually by the capacity of your sensory systems. I have tinnitus. If any of you know what that means, some of you I know do. Um, it's where you hear a constant ringing in your sound in your ears, ringing sound in your ear. And so that's something that I know that I have some deafness, and so it would be more difficult for me to hear certain frequencies than it would for you. The amount of background stimulation or noise, you guys know when you're in a busy classroom or in the commons, you need to talk louder in order to be heard. And so the level of, of noise that's around the stimulus or the signal that you're trying to detect can also influence uh, whether or not you're certain that you heard something and willing to say that you did. Response criterion has to do with motivation and expectancy, again, kind of related to top-down processing. So how willing are you to say that something's present? Now, we'll look at some examples together that show a great situations where you'd be much more willing to say that something's present because the error in certain directions might be a little bit more detrimental. Okay, so if you look at the very next graphic in your, uh, in your packet, what you see is an example of a signal detection grid. And so this one is framed in, in the sense of weather forecasting. But basically, the way this is lined up is such that there is a stimulus present or there is not a stimulus present. So presence or absence of the stimulus, yes or no here. And this is the forecaster's decision. The, the decision is, yes, there is something present here in this weather pattern, for example. No, there is not something there. In a hearing test, this side, the, the vertical side here, would be you raising your hand for yes, I hear something, or keeping your hand down, indicating no, I do not hear something. So this is the decision to say yes or no, it's present, and this is whether or not the stimulus is actually present, and that's where we get these combinations. Obviously, two of your boxes are correct, a hit, is a correct answer and a correct rejection where it's not present and you also say it's not present, those are right answers. The other two are errors, and if you're a stats person, you know what the errors look like. A no false alarm means the stimulus is not present, but you say it is, just like when you pull the fire alarm and nothing's there, there's no fire. Another error is a miss where the stimulus is there and you fail to acknowledge that it's present, okay? So we're gonna look at 